In today's video, we've got a hold of the GTX 1630, a strange card trying to find its own place on the market, and with a release like this, some things are very, very strange. Now this right here is the Palette GTX 1630, the latest release in Nvidia's budget lineup, something that they seem to be saturating with numerous amounts of cards, similar to what they did with the 8000-9000 series and the GTX 200 series where you weren't too sure what card was meant to fit in where. Either way, today this card is meant to be a replacement for the GTX 1050 and GT 1030, offering the performance of a GTX 1050, but the power consumption and flexibility of a 1030, something that does actually make sense as things progress technology wise. But when it retails for around the £150 mark, are these generational improvements actually worth it? Well, yes and no. I've got it all covered ahead and you can use the timelines along the bottom to find everything you want from benchmarks through to temperatures, 3D mark comparisons and the numerous issues that I've encountered during the making of this video. But either ways, thanks to the legendary palette and the power of Frobot the Robot, why don't we take a look at the specifications of the new graphics card being offered to us from Nvidia. Released just this month in 2022, it comes based on the 12 nanometer Turing process, complete with 512 CUDA cores, 4 gigabytes of GDDR6 RAM, and the main limit when it comes to these specifications is the absolutely tiny 64 bit memory bus, something you'd expect on any 30 series card, but one with this much power being crippled down by a 64 bit bus is something I didn't expect. You know, it came back to haunt us a little bit later on the video actually. As feature packed as it is, it does come with full DirectX 12 support, Vulkan support, but there is no support for ray tracing and more importantly DLSS, something that I had nothing but praise for back when I reviewed the other budget entry card, the RTX 3050. So really it's cards that's in a bit of a strange position. It's modern, but doesn't retain all the modern features we'd like to see on an entry level card. In its defence though, the card has a TDP of 75 watts, but usually, when you're actually gaming, only use around 45 watts of power, so I'm sure in the future we should see plenty of price drops and hopefully plenty of nice small low profile cards that people can stick in small SFF PCs and see some pretty compelling performance. Now I have wiped my entire system with all drivers using DDU, that includes the leftover Matrox ones, my current RTX 3050 ones and any other remnants of drivers. I've also replaced the RTX 3050 normally in my PC with this RTX GTX 1630 and will be using the latest Nvidia released drivers for the card. They appear to be WHQL certified, but did only come out about a week ago, so there are some issues with them. Luckily none of it during installation, it mostly comes down to when you're actually trying to configure the settings for games, which is something I'll touch on later on in the video. This of course was paired with my Ryzen 3700X and 32GB of RAM, so the only limit in our system today is this very graphics card, and the only way to find out how it performs in both the old and the new is in the benchmarks. Starting off our benchmarks with Red Dead Redemption 2, it quickly became clear that we were already going to see some limitations even this early on. Given the lack of DLSS or anything like that, we had to rely on the game's internal scaling to tone down that internal resolution. In full 1080p we saw a fluctuating frame rate that was anywhere between 25 and 35. With a 75% resolution scale we could often see anywhere between 40 and 60 which I found a lot better. It's mostly down to that minuscule memory bus which is limiting what we can actually show resolution wise all the while we actually use you know, settings we want to see. but all things accounted for, it did run alright with these settings. On a much more positive note though, Mountain Blade Banner Lord was running with the medium preset and a 1080p resolution without all too many drawbacks that we saw previously in Red Dead. Now larger battles will of course take their toll, but generally through to the late game it was quite impressive to see it running this well on a 30 tier card. Not that this is like any 30 series card we've seen before given the price point, but still, you wouldn't see this running on a 1030 or 730 this well, so to see the 1630 running it in 1080p, well you've got to give it some credit there. Now trying to continue on with this rather positive and surprising theme, we did in fact see Battlefield 5 run with a near perfect 60fps during large multiplayer battles. It involved quite a mix of settings just to try and keep the memory bus as free flowing as possible, but thanks to the rather optimised experience provided to us here and that very nice DirectX 12 support, it wasn't actually too bad to play. I mean there were certainly drops in some areas, but considering how these benchmarks started, I didn't expect to see this type of performance in such a large and intensive situation. 
Halo Infinite, on the other hand, did require me to drop virtually all the settings down to low. There are a few things like anisotropic filtering, which I left on medium just to help that texture detail in the distance, but generally the game did need this to run at anything like a competitive frame rate. After all that was done though, I think the game looked actually quite nice. Even at these lower settings, it does look really good. But then again, I'm also used to original Xbox graphics, so by my standards, virtually anything would look okay. Now, this is where things take a bit of a turn for the worse. Up until this point, we have managed some pretty modern gaming, with a few compromises here or there, but at least we could usually see something near the 1080p resolution. But the latest release of Crisis saw us needing 720p to even run the game with the medium preset. Once again, the card is crying out for DLSS, as then we could possibly see an upscaled 1080p experience with the same settings we're using here. Maybe I'm being critical. But 10 years ago, this money bought you a card that stood a fair chance of running your games in the highest settings with, you know, a 1080p or somewhat near 1080p resolution. And to see that 720p resolution for that money is slightly concerning. Admittedly, this was the only title where we had to do this. Good example of why the DLSS technology would have been a complete game changer in my opinion is with the use of AMD's FSR ironically, which does appear to work absolutely fine on Nvidia cards. It's the only reason we saw a solid 60fps with these high quality settings and there was none of the apparent blurriness we saw in titles like Red Dead Redemption 2, which you know didn't really have any form of scaling other than an internal resolution setting. We saw a near locked 60fps because of this, and it's a real shame that Nvidia hasn't packed this technology onto this card, as these visuals speak to themselves. We're running a new title in 1080p, with some sort of upscaling to handle the frame rate side of things, and it runs fine, and it looks great on a 30 series card. It's just a shame that we're relying on a game to have support for FSR, when a lot of games already have support for DLSS that we can't enjoy because we don't have that technology here. Star Wars Fallen Order was hard limited to around 40 FPS. You aren't really given a wealth of options unless you go and try and tweak the game for its hidden lower options, which I didn't really want to do. I did enable dynamic resolution scaling, which helped even out the frame rate and made the game very responsive to play. But remember a few weeks ago, we saw a Matrox graphics card nearly managing 30 FPS here a few weeks ago. It's just a tad underwhelming that a new entry of a card at a similar tier is almost matched by Matrox. Anyway, maybe if you opted for 720p or 900p, you could see a full 60fps, but at that stage, I'm kind of going to go tell you to just get an Xbox, which can manage that anyway. For indie titles, the card is of course more than adequate, which is really what this tier of card was designed for, at least it always used to be in the past, you know, entry level older games and indie titles, you know, with the GT 730, 1030, etc. But BeamNG could run with a really nice frame rate across most of the maps. It was understandably lower on some of the more intensive jungle based maps, but for the most part it did run very reasonably, even in a full 1080p. CSGO is always worth a test, as we're nearing the older section of the benchmarks. With the usual 1024x768 competitive settings, it was a no-brainer that the game ran well. So given we had quite a bit of utilisation to spare, I did decide to do the same settings in 1080p. Across a test of the Workshop benchmark and the Deathmatch game mode, both which proved to be far more excessive and intensive than the competitive game mode, we saw a frame rate well in the excess of 200fps a lot of the time. So no issues with CSGO. In fact, if you just wanted to stick this in a low powered PC to play CSGO, it's looking like a brilliant choice actually, as the OpenGL support on it seems to be fantastic. Then finally to round us off with, we have GTA 5 running here with the standard high settings, soft shadows and a perfectly crisp 1080p resolution. There wasn't much point going higher than this as we saw a dramatic drop to the frame rate. Now one of my concerns so far is that this was the same performance we were seeing on graphics cards 10 years ago, and I'm very familiar with the performance of GTA 5 across the years, as I've had it since it came out on PC and was one of the people to pre-order it. And most of the benchmarks, well, they're not far off a HD 7970, which is borderline the performance we're seeing across most of the benchmarks. Don't get me wrong, we're peaking out at 48 watts here running GTA 5. But even so, that's more or less this card summed up. 10 year old performance in a modern day package without any of the modern day features. And it is very conflicting to say that, as it's the lack of the modern day features that make me a little bit uneasy benchmarking this card against modern titles. That concludes our benchmarks, and I'm going to continue on that last point. 
I got to talking to a few people over in the Budget Builds Discord about the performance, and we noted that at its worst, it's around the same as a Terrascale card from 2008, admittedly the best of the Terrascale cards with the 5970, and at the best, it's performing around a HD 7970 or a GTX 770. Rather old cards by today's standard. Now, this is by no means a bad thing performance wise. You have to remember that games today are still designed to target a cut up Fire Pro and the Xbox One, so virtually any current releases will continue to work on this card. But it's going to run as well as a flagship from 10 years ago, a flagship that you can buy online for anywhere between 40 to 50 pounds. So before we get into the positives of this card, I do just have a few slight criticisms of Nvidia's new release. Nothing major, but just a few things I wanted to touch on across my week plus using this card. Now, I had some major instabilities on the latest drivers, and I know this is the first release, but they just feel rushed. The previous Nvidia release we saw with the RTX 3050, a card that I still use every day, had pretty fantastic drivers even for us pre-release reviewers. I didn't have any crashing whilst configuring games, and it was all around brilliant experience. Here though, the drivers feel a bit sloppy. Many games would simply crash when asking them to change multiple, rather intensive settings at once, and some games would straight up reset over and over again, relying on the use of the safe mode setting in the terms of Rockstar games to actually get them running at the settings they liked. There wasn't an issue in all titles, but a select few. My other criticism was, of course, as I've mentioned, the lack of any newer NVIDIA features. I said it before and I'll say it again. The inclusion of things like DLSS is a game changer on the low end. Even if the performance isn't up to scratch, that upscaling technology single-handedly allows for us to see 1080p visuals with a performance hit of 720p or below, which is a game changer on a 30 series card that often does end up seeing itself running at 720p a few years down the line. You know, it'd really extend the lifetime of this card if it had those features, and it's a shame to see them just admitted here. It really just change up how things would be in a few years, but other than that, those are my only real issues with the card. Goes without saying though that this version of the card is however absolutely fantastic. During my entire time testing through a 5 hour 3D Mark torture test, the card never exceeded 65C. In terms of power consumption, most of the time the card tended to operate beneath the 50 watt power envelope. At its peak in Red Dead Redemption 2 and Crisis, I saw 56 watts of usage. And for classic flagship performance at that power usage, that is very impressive. I do have to question though, why do 99% of the releases of this card have a 6 pin connector? When realistically this tier of card never used to need one. Still, if you do fancy this card, I would say do take a look at Palette's offerings. I've been using their cards for well on a decade now. Uh, I've even got, you know, you can see Robot the Robot boxes in the background of some older videos there, and every time they've been flawless from the low end to the high end. You really do get the benefit of that Frobot the Robot heritage to boot, so no issues there with the palette card on any level. Trying to think of other things to test at this point, I did decide to test NVENC recording, as given it is a small 30 series card, it's nice to see it included on here, and the main downside is that it's not the latest encoder. It is the old Volta encoder of yesteryear. Hardly a bad thing, and it did more than an adequate job when paired with OBS. One thing that is rather interesting to note though, is that SimCity from 2013 didn't run all too well in the background. You can see me having to run the game in 720p back there, which is a bit concerning for a new release on a not very intensive game. Either way, it might just be an oversight, these are early drivers, and I imagine a lot of these issues with rather niche titles will probably be ironed out in a few weeks' time. So, you know, it's impressive in a few ways, but really, this is one of those releases you're going to have to decide for yourself. That right there brings us around to the end of the video. And well, this is one of the most impressive 30 series cards, and a bloody good variant here by Pallet. But my concern is that the 30 series of cards has always been a 50 to 70 pound region card, usually for small form factor upgrades and display outputs with a bit of extra gaming performance thrown in there. And I'm in two hearts about this. On the one hand, as a budget PC channel, I am very wary about the prices of graphics cards and what is on the market. And I use an RTX 3050, which isn't too much more expensive than this, but is more than good enough to be my go-to card every day. On the other hand though, this card, while not being quite powerful enough, is sort of entering its own niche by being low power, 
but with older flagship level performance. Personally, I don't think that warrants the price markup over the previous generation of 30 series cards, but given that there are probably price drops imminent in the future, I think this card will eventually settle down into a nice sub £100 price point on the market. I can't predict anything though, so we can only wait and see. Personally, I hope you all enjoyed watching this video. It's been a lot of work trying to see what will run, what won't run, and a good benchmark suite here, so thank you very much for watching, and good night.